most guys don't realize this. When they experience rejection or doubt in real life, porn is a place they can go to always feel wanted. So instead of living out of their identity in Christ, mm -hmm. man, they're living out of the shame identity because, man, this, this has been part of their life. For some men, the addiction starts in their teens. Using phones, tablets, and laptops, they find ways to download and view pornography, hiding it from their parents. I mean, the number one killer of men today, emotionally, psychologically, physically even, the Surgeon General just said, is isolation and loneliness. Paul says, man, the, the mind is the battlefield. Yeah. The strongholds have to be destroyed. Yeah. We're not finding our joy and satisfaction in the things of God, then we're going to turn to carnal pleasure. Fam, so glad to be with you today. Dr. Williams, you're here with us. Ted, you're here with us. I'm here. It's going to be a big morning. <laughs> Let's go. It's going to be a big, big morning. Uh, before we get into the show, man, I was in Tennessee uh, a couple months back, and I was meeting with campus leaders. Mm. So they've done a lot of campus ministry in Nashville, uh, Vanderbilt, Belmont, things of that nature. And it's interesting. Um, every conversation we had, we had about a three hour conversation. I was there presenting on manhood and masculinity. Every conversation kept going to pornography. Mm. Every conversation uh, that, that these young men, specifically young men on these college campuses were just struggling and wrestling with, with a porn addiction. And it's interesting. My 10-year-old son was there with me. I took him on this trip. So he's at the dinner hearing everything. Yeah. And as we're walking out to the, to the car to go back to the hotel, my son looks at me and says, Dad, I got a question. I said, yeah, what's up, man? He said, what's pornography? Hmm. And as much as his little 10-year-old mind and heart could take, you know, I explained to him. And he said, man, that's, he said, Dad, that's devastating. He said, that's awful. And as I was driving to the hotel, man, the Holy Spirit just kind of came on me, and I thought, I thought, how beautiful is this? Mm. Because when I was introduced to pornography, mm. it was a celebration. Yeah. It was a friend saying, hey, come check this out. Mm. But when my son was introduced to it, it was devastation. He saw all the devastating effects, and I'm praying that that makes all the difference. Yeah, that's yeah. what sticks. I'm praying that that makes all the difference. So we're going we're gonna to talk today uh, not just about the devastating effects of porn. You know, I think in a lot of ways people understand that. But but deeper, how it affects the mind, how it affects the heart, how it's tearing families and in and, and a lot of ways our, our country apart. We're so happy to have uh, with us today uh, Ted Shimmer from The Freedom Fight. The mm -hmm. Freedom Fight. You guys got to check this out. Ted, welcome, man. Tell us a little bit about yourself, dude. Hey, it's good to be here. Well... Mm -hmm. I tell people when I went into the ministry, you know, over 30 years ago, I had no aspirations to become the porn guy. <laughs> and, uh, you know, that's not something you're aiming for. Uh, <laughs> and if my wife were here, she'd tell you she had no aspirations to be married to the porn guy. Yeah, no uh, doubt. In many ways. But, right. <laughs> but it was really birth, man, out of necessity because I, we went on staff in 91 with student mobilization, okay. you know, college discipleship ministry, because yeah. we wanted to disciple men and women. And... In the context of discipling men, we started noticing something in the early to mid-2000s. More and more of our male student leaders were being disqualified from leadership mm. because of a porn addiction. Wow. Yeah. So much so that in 07, as a ministry, we identified pornography as the biggest obstacle to us fulfilling our ministry, our vision, our mission to build spiritual leaders for Christ. Mm. Mm. And so we recognized... If our discipleship is not addressing this issue, man, we have a huge gap in our discipleship. And so yeah. that's really when I, you know, started my deep dive into the topic, really learning all I could, you know, getting formally trained in it, uh, you know, going through dozens of different programs, you know, as I would walk with different staff and students who were struggling. Um, you know, this one one staff guy. You know, we went through multiple online programs, and you know, sent him to sex addiction therapist. Mm. We even sent him out to California for a one-month live-in program. Wow. And I always say, man, when you start sending people to California for help, you know you're desperate. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. That's how bad it got. <laughs> no doubt. But it was really through that process we started identifying, hey, what are the principles that are biblically based, scientifically informed, gospel-centered, clinically sound, and effective? Wow. And we started using these with our staff and students. And, and what we were finding is not only were people finding freedom, 
uh, man, they were experiencing deep growth in discipleship. Mm. Um, and so really in 2015, I really just felt compelled, hey, let's put these principles in a more user-friendly format. So that's when we started building our online, it's a free, you know, porn addiction recovery and discipleship program. It's all online, the freedomfight.org. Um, so we started building in 2015, launched in 2017, and then added an app, um, you know. And so that's, that was my story of going from, a man, disciples making with men uh, to becoming the porn guy. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Jonathan, you founder of Gospel Family Ministries, seminary professor, longtime pastor. Mm. Where and, and how prominent have you seen pornography in, in the myriad of conversations you've had over the last 20 years? Yeah, I think my experience is similar to Ted. It was leading a ministry where you really, unfortunately, see how devastating this is, how widespread it is. And I think I was kind of naive to it. Uh, and, and part of that is the technology. And so early on in my ministry, the technology wasn't there like it is now. My ministry started before smartphones, before iPhones, and, and all those things. But the, as the technology grew and this problem became more and more widespread, uh, that's when I started seeing how much it's impacting families. And so when I was pastoring, for example, at our church, I started to see how many young people, yes, were, were addicted to it. How many young people, even in the church, didn't even think it was a problem? Like they would say, I, I don't get the big deal. But then also, how many grown adult men were battling this? How, how many husbands, how many fathers? Uh, I had one week when I was pastoring where in one week I had four different men in our church. Individually, it wasn't together, just one at a time throughout that one week, came and confessed addiction to pornography. Mm. These were deacons, Sunday school teachers, staff member, uh, and I just saw, maybe for the first time as a young pastor, just, it's everywhere. And, and I asked the same question to each man. I, I said, when did you start? When, when was it you were first exposed to pornography? How long has this been a sin that you've been battling? How long would you say this has been an addiction for you? The answers were all either 11 or 12 or 13. Wow. Mm. And then all of our research, and Ted, I know mm. you, you talk about this, is getting younger. Yeah. Is that what you're seeing, that yeah. the research says, when are they now diving into pornography, being exposed for the first time? What's the average age? Between, you know, there's two studies I, I refer to in my book, but between 8 and 11 is yeah. the age of first Gosh. exposure and getting younger. And, you know, and I think a lot of times when we talk about this topic, a lot of old timers can think, well, you know, I mean, every generation, you know, has to deal with porn and, you know, just navigate it. And But people who have that perspective don't understand, man, how significant the technology shift of 06 mm. going from dial-up to high speed and then that being delivered to iPhones in 07 mm. because it unleashed an unprecedented amount of, man, X-rated material on the adolescent brain, mm. which we understand the adolescent brain is more susceptible to addictive substances. Mm. And so if somebody gets hooked as an adolescent to an addictive substance, which porn is, the chances that it becomes a lifelong struggle yeah. go way up. This, oh, is, wow. this is why we have laws in place to keep addictive substances away from the adolescent brain. You know, if you know, you can't, you know, drink or smoke or use tobacco if you're under 18. Because we know from science the adolescent brain is more susceptible to addictive substances. Mm -hmm. And so most parents mm -hmm. have no idea when they hand their 11 or 12-year-old an iPhone, they're giving them access to one of the more addictive substances on the planet. Wow. Yeah, we talked wow. about this in a previous episode. Uh, that, that idea of handing a phone, handing an iPad, and really handing them just this open door to, to so much pornography that's out there. And I think I shared with you, Chris, but Tim Charlie's wrote a blog once, and it said parents, it's right before Christmas, he said, stop giving porn to your kids for Christmas. And his point was, if you're just handing them iPhone, iPad, no conversation, no discipleship, no boundaries whatsoever, th they're going to find it. And, and to your point, it can quickly become an addiction mm -hmm. Have you seen the need for parents yeah. that know how to navigate that technology with their kids? Yeah. Are you hearing yeah. parents ask, how do I do this? Yeah, absolutely. And and to your point, not only are they going to find it, but it's going to find them. Mm. Yeah, even if they're not looking for it. That's right. Because, uh, and I think, Ted, you speak to this well, we live in an over-sexualized society. Like far more than, this isn't 1965 
you find, you know, your dad's Playboy underneath the bed, mm. right? I mean, we live in a hyper sexualized society. So, mm. I mean, I'm watching a basketball game with my 10 year old, and I can't tell you how many times, even during a basketball game, I got to cut away. Yeah. Uh, just because it's, you know, what would have been considered graphic in 1970 is considered okay in 2024. Mm -hmm for a cheerleader or for a dancer or for a commercial. Mm -hmm. uh, and that doesn't even include all of the same sex stuff and, and, yeah. and stuff they're seeing on TV. So, um, yeah, it's it's everywhere. Where, what are you seeing, Ted, in that kind of over-sexualized society? Um, you talk about that, that addictiveness of the brain, especially for adolescents. There are some countries that have noticed that, right? And aren't they creating laws against this? Yeah, absolutely. I was... Actually, uh, before a U.S. congressional committee in October oh, wow. um, presenting this, the, and the reality is both France and the U.K. have passed federal legislation hmm. um, to protect minors from porn. Wow. Uh, the University of California at Berkeley, one of the more liberal institutions on planet Earth, hmm. in 2022, they published an article calling pornography a public health crisis. Wow because of how it impacts the brain, how it fosters violence against women, abuse mm. against kids. Uh, the research is in. And so, you know, my uh, message to Congress is, hey, we have growing mountains of secular research that shows, man, how destructive this is. So this is, I didn't even bring up a moral issue. You know, that, that doesn't, that's not going to, you know, sway any legislation anyway. Yeah. But you don't need to because... You know, we've got the secular governments, you know, hmm. secular institutions. They're all pointing to, you know, the massive amounts of research of how destructive, uh, you know, pornography is, especially, you know, for adolescents. And, and that's, you know, again, one of the things, you know, that people don't recognize is, you know, the destructiveness and the addictiveness, you know, because you imagine, man, a, an eight-year-old and they, they see pornography you know, and a lot of times they haven't had the sex talk with their dad. Mm. And, you know, where, where do they go with that? The shame mount. Mm. They feel guilt and shame. They also mm. feel excitement. They, they get hit with a dopamine rush they never mm. experienced before. And, but they're like, man, I can't, I can't talk to my, my mom and dad. You know, hey, I'm going to get in trouble for this. Mm. Right. And they keep it a secret. Um, and so that's what's awesome about, you know, you having that conversation with your son and getting the topic on the table is huge. Yeah. What are the, you know, what are some of those effects? Because I'm thinking about, like, I'm thinking about me personally, right? This, I wrestle with a lot of stuff. Mm. Like the old Chris Harper man, man of, the old man of death. Like every day I got to wake up and drown him. Problem is he's a really good swimmer. I mean, it's <laughs> rough, right? I've been fortunate that I've never I've never really wrestled with a pornography addiction. Mm -hmm. It wasn't even I didn't even really know it was a thing until I read Mark Driscoll's book Porn Again Christian that it was mm -hmm. even a thing in the church, which was a phenomenal little resource. It was unbelievable. Um, so, so to someone like me watching that, that that maybe we're in a bubble somewhat or or whatever it is, what are those effects of pornography? Um, on minors, on on families, on marriages. What are what are some of the the diagnosed, some of the moral, some of the ethical? What are the effects that we're seeing? Mm. Well, and I think you know, and it's really you know, kind of multi tiered. You know, as we we talk about the impact. Um, I was on a, a radio program a couple years ago, and a mom called in and shared the horrifying story of discovering that her 10-year-old daughter was addicted to porn Yeah, mm. and had been for almost a year. Because it's, it's not a male-dominant no. issue, right? It's both. Yeah, it's yeah, both. I hear, I hear that. Um, yeah, I hear that. Yeah. And so for this mom, she's like, I've got three boys. I thought I had to worry about them in this area, and yet my daughter's been addicted for a year. And so wow. when she went and talked to her daughter, the daughter said, Mom, I don't want to look at this stuff, but I can't stop. Wow. Hmm. And the thing I tried to help the mom understand is, hey, this doesn't mean that your daughter's a sexual pervert. Right. But the dopamine rush that she experienced was nothing like she's ever experienced before. Mm. And that has become her happy place. When she's down, lonely, stressed, anxious, bored, man, that's where she goes. Mm. And, and so because addiction experts tell us that 
when somebody starts using their addictive substance, whether it's drugs, alcohol, or porn, to medicate negative emotions in their life, that's when an addiction goes deep. Mm -hmm. And so, as an example, if I use you know, porn to medicate stress, and I do that repeatedly, then the next time I'm stressed, guess what? My brain actually releases dopamine to start the craving mm -hmm. because my brain goes into survival Come mode. On. Hey, Come I know where we can go to feel a whole lot better. Wow. And this happens at a subconscious level. And so when I work with guys and they're like, man, this huge urge to use porn just hit me out of nowhere. You know, we, use, we go back and it's usually an emotional trigger. Hmm. That, you trained that let them, your body. You trained your body. And the, the, the mind goes into survival mode. Hey, I know where we can go to feel a whole lot better. And so, hmm. you know, to your original question, man, that is stunting, you know, kids' uh, emotional development. Yeah. The, you know, we talk about mental health a lot. Man, that's a huge piece of it because people aren't processing their emotions. They're numbing them hmm. in, in our over-medicated society. And porn is the medication of choice. Wow. Uh, which most men don't realize, you know, and I, I talk to students all the time and men and they're like, well, man, porn's kind of my stress reliever, mm. you know? And so they're like, Hey, it just kind of takes the edge off. And, um, and man, they don't, they don't realize that, man, that is stunting their emotional and relational growth in, wow. in a number of areas. Yeah. I think it was, I don't know if it was Augustine. It was one of the old church fathers, but he said, he said, when man doesn't find joy and satisfaction in God and things of the and things of God, he'll he'll turn to carnal pleasures mm. to find that joy and satisfaction and substance and purpose. All the things we should be getting from the Lord. That's right. Yeah. From the world. So and and Ted, if I'm hearing you right, if it is a process of training our minds and training our bodies, um, if it is a an, an addiction and a release of dopamine. Is it is it good to say because I hear so much like behavior modification stuff, right? Mm -hmm. And I also hear a lot of a lot of pastors or a lot of leaders, you know, a man says I'm wrestling with porn and the response is, Well, stop. Mm -hmm. It's like that old Bob Newhart <laughs> SNL, like, you know, just stop it. Just stop. <laughs> She's like, Well, I'm having suicidal thoughts. Well, just don't do that anymore. Stop. Like like yeah. and, and I hear that. And there's no way that's helpful. Mm -hmm. Like there's no yeah. way that's helpful. So so what's the What's the process to begin healing or to begin fi to find to begin to find freedom? Well, and I think that's such a great question because you know in Jeremiah six fourteen, when God he was rebuking his spiritual leaders and he says the leaders of my people are are healing my the brokenness of my people superficially, mm -hmm. saying peace peace but there is no peace. Oh, wow. And so God is rebuking the spiritual leader. Hey, you're giving, you're giving cliches, you know, hey, peace, peace. It's, and unfortunately, I see that a ton with guys, because if you think about it, if you're a guy that's struggling with porn, and you have been since you were 11, and, you know, man, you're wrestling as a 30-year-old man, and the pastor's like, hey, you just need to love Jesus more and quit. Mm. You know, man, the, the shame that multiplies. Wow. Uh, man, well, hey, I was going to share my secret and struggle with somebody, but but no more mm -hmm. because man, I'm there's something broken uh, in me, and man, that that keeps so many people um, just in the shadows. And so the first step towards healing, you know, James five sixteen says, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. Mm -hmm. But that first step is confessing to a trusted friend or mentor, bringing it into the light, mm -hmm. and because. Once you bring it into the light, then man, you can start getting help, um, you know, for your problem. But that's a that's the first step uh, towards freedom. Yeah. Well, you talk about getting help, and, and you mentioned the ten year old daughter who goes to mama and says, "I need help." Or you talk about the man who's been addicted thirty years who says, "I can't beat this. I've tried. I've tried everything on my own." Do you, in your experience in your ministry, do parents know how to help their kids find that freedom? Do pastors know how, how to help the people in their church? And how, how do you equip parents to have that conversation? How do you equip pastors to know how to disciple these guys that are struggling with it? Yeah. How, how do we equip parents and pastors to actually help them find that freedom? Yeah, well, I think, you know, educating pastors and, and parents on the issue, on the addictiveness, on, you know, man, just how pervasive it is, how destructive it is, how addictive it is. And because 
if you don't understand that, um, you know, and then understand that, hey, this is a holistic approach yeah. of dealing with this because it's not just a spiritual issue. It's also an emotional issue, mm. but it's also a brain issue. So there's, you know, physiology mixed into this. Sure. And so, um, and, and just, you know, looking at, you know, the whole picture, but, and it's important for, for pastors as they navigate this to understand the power of shame. Mm. You know, as an example, I was at a, a church service, you know, a few years back, and the pastor gave a great message out of Colossians on sexual immorality, which mm. the Greek word is pornia, mm. where we get our word pornography. Mm. And he said, hey, if this is something you, that you struggle with, we've got some groups, and, you know, if you want to get in one of those groups, we have a booth in the back. How many do, guys do you think signed up at the booth in the back? <laughs> For their grandmother, <laughs> with their wives watching, their kids watching. Oh, I bet they were sprinting back yeah. there. <laughs> no. Well, and even if it, even if it was, well, hey, come Wednesday night at seven. Mm. You know, unless your wife is giving you an ultimatum or your life is in crisis, you're not going no. because you don't know who else is going to be there, and so this secret that you've had for years. You don't know who else you're going to be disclosing it to by coming to this meeting. Yeah. And so really helping, you know, pastors for one understand this isn't a recovery issue only, but it must become a discipleship yeah. issue because when it's a discipleship issue, hey, we all need to get equipped in this area. Yeah. This is such a massive issue. We all need to be equipped so we can help others walk in freedom. And so hmm. that's that's the message that we really try to help pastors you know, have a perspective of dealing with this issue because it has to be part of our discipleship, just like it was part of Paul's discipleship in the book of Ephesians mm. when he addressed, you know, the, the sexual bondage that many of the Ephesian believers were stuck in. Man, it was part of his discipleship. He addressed it. He gave them real solutions, you know, for this issue. And so navigating the shame piece is important. And I would just add this related to the parents you know, getting the topic on the table early. Yeah. Um, you know, one resource we encourage is good pictures, bad pictures. Mm. Oh. But it's it's this book, um, and I think believe it's for kids seven to twelve. They also have a junior version. But man, it just introduces the topic even before you've had the sex talk. Mm. You need to have the porn talk. Mm. Hey, there's good pictures and bad pictures, and in, in a very age appropriate way, it even unpacks just some of. Um, you know, the brain science, so, yeah. hey, how it impacts your thinking. Um, and so I know a lot of parents, you know, read through that book on a, you know, an annual basis, just knowing, well, hey, each year your kids are going to, mm -hmm. you know, grow and understand a little bit more and have more experiences. Um, but it's getting that topic on the table and saying, hey, if you ever see a bad picture, hey, come talk to me. Mm -hmm. um, and so just opening up that dialogue um, is really important. And then, Good. You know, as far as resources, that's why we created our website. Um, so our main resource is a six-month, you know, discipleship recovery, you know, program. And we have a 30-day challenge, which is where we, we typically encourage people to start. And so a lot of dads will take their teenage son through that, but it's all free. It's all online. That's great. Um, but just some, you know, resources there. And we have some other parent resources uh, on the website as well. That's, that's good, man. I'm, I'm reminded of a time in scripture where so david sees bathsheba mm. um basically in her evening routine right taking a bath dressing etc and he's he's living out an x-rated movie mm. you know he's watching from one roof to another i think as the scripture describes it later on he sees her and he says who is that he's wanting to find out who she is and i don't know who he's asking but but the man replies, and it's really interesting how the man replies. The man replies, that's Bathsheba, wife of Uriah, mm. daughter of such and such. And, and immediately he personalized her. Mm. Where, where David had objectified her, right? Who's that beautiful woman? Whoever was his trusted friend there said, wait, whoa, 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 slow down. That's somebody's wife. Mm. That's somebody's daughter. Right, good. that's a that's that the Imago day. He was reinforcing yeah. the Imago day, and I I love that good picture, bad mm. picture because because so often, especially as men, I know I'm guilty of this. Um, I I can objectify thing. I can objectify women, right? Mm. And and I'm quick to forget that, man. That's that's God's daughter. 
You know, that's mm-hmm. that's God's creation. That's probably somebody's wife. Yeah. That's somebody's daughter. That's somebody's. You know, and I think if we could if we could get there sooner, mm-hmm. uh, maybe that maybe that would help prevent um, the escalation into this. But but I know there's a lot of a lot of men that watch our show, and there's a lot of men that are addicted to porn that are watching mm-hmm. this show. Yeah, right. And and they want freedom. So I love the 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 confess to bring it on the table, expose it to light, uh, the resources. But when you use the word freedom, define that for us. What does it mean to be free from a, from a porn addiction? <clears throat> yeah, that's a great question. And I, you know, one of my mentors in this area is Dr. Ted Roberts, who you know founded the uh, you know Pure De- Pure Desire Ministry, and we really kind of adopted his his definition of freedom. That man, there's been no acting out, you know, porn or masturbation for two years, mm. yeah. and the development of godly habits in relationships. Come on. Mm-hmm. And so it's not just, hey, I just haven't done this behavior, but it's replacing that behavior with, man, godly habits in relationships. Because when a person is stuck, you know, in a porn addiction, man, they're developing other habits, mm. man. Hey, how do I how do I medicate my pain? Yeah. How do I numb out? You know, and you all of a sudden you're starting to develop, man. How do I go to God? There you how go. do I take, you know, just like King David did in Psalm 139, taking his anxiety. You know, search mm-hmm. me, O God, know my heart, try my anxious thoughts, and see if there's any hurtful way in me. That was a that was a warrior king saying, mm-hmm. Lord, I've got some anxiety here. You know, I don't know if it's, you know, connected to something hurtful. Mm. We, you know, I'm inviting you in instead yeah. of, man, let me just, uh, man, I got something going on. Let me go, man, you know, medicate. Um, mm. And so that definition, and I would just say this to the men listening. One of the lies the enemy gets them to believe is freedom is not possible. Mm. But man, freedom is absolutely possible. Mm. That's good. And it's so important because there's so many guys that have, you know, man, I've tried so many things. I've tried to stop. I've, you know, tried different programs and man, I can't get free. Well, yeah. freedom is possible. The, you know, the enemy wants to, to give up hope that it's not, mm-hmm. but it truly is. And I would just, you know, want to encourage them that, man, God wants to grow and develop you in the process of becoming free. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so it's not just, you know, there's, there's a very small percent of people who get the miraculous deliverance yeah. from addiction. Yeah, that's right. Um, you know, whether it's drug, alcohol, or porn. But for the vast majority, you don't just quit a porn habit. You have to outgrow it. Come on. By growing and developing in key areas of life. And, and for the Freedom Fight program, we pull those directly from Ephesians 4. When Paul mm. was talking to the Ephesian believers stuck in sexual bondage and just... Hey, these are the these are the areas you got to renew your mind. Yeah. You know, as he talks oh, about, wow. you you've got to grow in holiness. Mm. Man, you've got to grow in your identity in Christ. Which I, I will say this because I think a lot of our you know our viewers will will resonate, and I think it will will help us understand just kind of man the diabolical nature of this. Mm. But one of the things that men you know one of their biggest triggers is, man, when they experience rejection or doubt uh, in real life, porn is a place they can go to always feel wanted, mm. huh. to always feel accepted, wow. to always feel desired. Mm. In, in this fantasy world of porn, and most guys don't realize this, and I, I've worked with a lot of guys through the years, but for the majority of guys, man, that's their biggest trigger is, man, when I get some rejection – Man, if I have a failure, man, this huge urge to go use porn because mm. that's where they have gone. So instead of living out of their identity in Christ, mm. yeah. man, they're living out of the shame identity because, man, this this has been part of their life. Um, oh, yeah. It becomes, like you said, it's, it's this habit. You're trying to equip them to replace that with godly habits. And I love that you just even use the word freedom, you know, because freedom implies you're enslaved to something. You know, and that's what the scriptures teach us, right, is whatever overcomes you, that you are enslaved to. And so if we are enslaved, you know, addiction has probably a hundred different definitions. Uh, but when you're addicted to pornography, biblically, we, we mean you're enslaved to it. It's become your master. It's overcome you. And so there's this great need, not like you were saying, not just to stop, but to really be set free 
And, and biblically, you know, we believe that freedom is only possible in Christ. But I love what you're saying that uh, we don't want to just clean the house to get rid of the pornography. We want to fill the house with these beautiful gospel things. So I want to ask you a question about the mind. You know, so so much of pornography is living in the mind. You know, one author calls it the great battlefield uh, for men. Mm. It's just our mind, our thoughts. And Scripture says so much about our mind. So how, how do you purify your thoughts? How do you take your thoughts captive? How do you lead men to find freedom in their thoughts and actually grow to a point to where, like Scripture says, they can love the Lord their God with all their mind. They can set their mind on heavenly things, not on earthly things. You know, what does Paul say? Whatever is pure and lovely, think on these. So all these beautiful Scriptures of our mind and our thoughts, how do we get there? How, How do we take our thoughts captive, purify our thoughts, and redeem our minds, renew our minds? Yeah, no, that's a great, great question. And you know, when when guys are are struggling with with pornography, in you know, man, in, in a few months, you know, sometimes less, we can help them stop the behavior. Mm. So, but the last the last stronghold is is fantasy and masturbation. Mm. You know, that's that's the last stronghold, and so. You know, but that, yeah, that passage out of 2 Corinthians 10, 3 through 5, but just the, you know, Paul says, man, the the mind is the battlefield. Yeah. And the strongholds have to be destroyed. Yeah. Um, and so really helping people understand that, that, hey, you know, brain science tells us that, man, when a person thinks a new thought or practices a new behavior, man, the brain actually forms a new neurological connection. Hmm. And man, the more that that thought is repeated, mm. the stronger that connection gets. The Bible tells us that when that, when that stronghold, when that um, you know, thought is a lie, it's a stronghold. Mm. And man, that stronghold has to be broken down. Yeah. And, and so that's one of the things that we teach in our program is to begin identifying the lies, mm. man, that keep us stuck, the lies about where I, I, our identity lies. Hey, it's not in our performance. It's not in others' opinions, Mm. but it's in who we are in Christ. And and so beginning to, you know, and then in verse five, as you said, man, taking every thought captive. And so, man, just, you know, holding that up that, you know, and I was talking to one of the groups I'm I'm leading now just a couple of weeks ago, and we were talking on this topic. And it's, man, as we think about, man, taking every thought captive, we could view that from one vantage point of, well, man, that kind of kind of seems excessive, but it's like, man, King Jesus is worthy of every thought we have, man, to be turned into worship. That's yeah. good. And so, hey, let's view this as an opportunity to worship mm. that, man, as, as we are identifying our thoughts. Um, and so in our program, and I think one of the things that, um, you know, has made it effective is, you know, there's daily check-ins. Mm-hmm. And so, man... Guys take two or three minutes, man, hey, this is where I am emotionally, this is how I'm doing, but it's an opportunity, hey, man, here's a thought, mm. man, that I'm struggling with, man, hey, I want to bring it into light, you know, hey, I'm, I'm taking my thoughts captive. And so when you get into a group of men that are, are doing the same thing, mm. and they're starting to memorize scripture about those truths mm. so that they can destroy those strongholds that they're believing about themselves, because, you know, we've mentioned some of the strongholds that, hey, man, Freedom's not possible. Mm. That's a that's a lie that's of the lie. enemy. It's oh. like, hey, as soon as somebody believes that, you know, man, they're stuck. Yeah. Or, hey, there's something wrong with me because, man, nobody else is struggling like I am because you know everybody's you know in the shadows, hiding, <laughs> hiding, hiding, hiding yeah. Sin. And so mm. it's like, well, man, there must be something wrong with me that you know, man, is is broken. And so that's a that's a key point. And so. It really adds a whole new dimension to man renewing the mind, yeah, and you know replacing those lies with God's truth. Yeah. And well, I was gonna ask you, Chris. Part of that you said you got to get guys in a room together. They got to be vulnerable. They got to confess, and then they have to run the race together. That that accountability and Harp, you spend every day discipling men. How important is accountability for this? Can you beat it on your own? Can you find freedom on your own? Or, or how important is men having men to run the race together. How important is that accountability? Absolutely. It's the most important thing. Hmm. I mean, the number one killer of men today, emotionally, psychologically, physically, even the Surgeon General just said is isolation and loneliness. Hmm. 
you know, and back to what we said at the beginning of the show, you know, if we're not finding our joy and satisfaction in the things of God, then we're going to turn to carnal pleasures, which means um, the guy that's sitting in his basement by himself right now watching pornography, um, he's there because he's sad and lonely. Mm. He's there. He's there because something's broken, as you mentioned. There's there's this giant void that he's trying to, to trying to fill, and and you can't do that outside of community, right? God is the original OG. God's the first small group. We think mm-hmm. we invented small groups. Mm-hmm. God invented small groups. God mm-hmm. the Father, God the Son, God the Spirit. They wow. coexisted co eternally. Mm-hmm. So if we're made in His image. We're made for community. Yeah. No man's an island. Yeah. Like we're most like God. I really believe this. We're most like God when we're living in community with one another. That's good. And when we're not, we're not being, you know, who God called and created us to be. Mm-hmm. So so to Ted point, to to your point, it's it's probably impossible, and I don't want to put words in your mouth, it's probably impossible to find freedom alone, is what I would guess. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, and I, and I think that's such a important piece is is that community element that because mm-hmm. you know even in Second uh, Timothy two twenty two you know when he talks about you know fleeing the youth, the youthful passions yeah. and pursue righteousness faith love and peace mm-hmm. with those who call on the Lord from a pure heart. Come and on. So and as the Apostle Paul is saying, hey, you need to flee this. And you need to pursue something else. You got to do it with a with a group, and and so it's just it's so important um, because living living in the light, um, you know, is is critical because nobody finds freedom on their own, mm-hmm. and and it's really important, you know, and particularly for the pastors, you know, to understand man the the spiritual destructiveness that takes place because you mentioned isolation, man. When somebody feels shame. They are necessarily moving away, mm. man, from the closest people in their life, mm. from their closest oh, relationship. And, and, and the research backs this up. You know, 1 Peter 2.11 says, Abstain from fleshly lust, which wages war against the soul. Mm. And so think about that for a minute. When God was describing how fleshly lust, like pornography, impacts a person, he used warfare imagery. And he says it wages war against the deepest part of who we are. Mm. And there was a six-year study of 3,000 people done out of the University of Oklahoma, peer-reviewed study, looking at the impact of pornography on a person. And what they found is, man, it's waging war on multiple fronts, but one of the fronts was spiritual growth, Mm -hmm. that any porn use was, was in correlation with declines in religious commitment and behavior, like prayer, going to church, and Mm -hmm. an increase in religious doubts. Mm. So think about this. If you wanted Christians to be less committed to praying, going to church, and reading their Bible, and you wanted them to doubt more, just get them to watch porn. Wow. I mean, that, that, you know, that, that research is really illustrating, man, how porn is waging war against the soul. Um, And it's huge. It's wrecking (laughs) a generation's relationship with the Lord. Yeah, but I, I love what you're saying. You know, flee from this and run to this. It's not just run away from pornography. It's sprint toward Jesus. Yes. it's not just flee isolation. It's like Harp saying, run to community. Yeah. You know, and and I think a lot of times we we talk only about you know the killing it, the stopping it, the putting it to death, which is biblical, of course. Put to death sexual morality, impurity, and lust. But we we also have this call to draw near to the Lord. You know, to run him, to Him and to do that mm. in community. So let's talk on the other side real quick. Let's say there's a man or a woman who's been struggling with addiction and they get in community. They got uh, people discipling them and they're running the race together and they're seeking Jesus for the first time, maybe saying, I could only find freedom in Christ. They find freedom. What's the blessings of that? What's what's that look like on the other side? You find freedom from pornography, maybe for the first time in decades. Mm. What what kind of joy do you see? What kind of blessings? What relationships does it bless? What, What have you seen? Yeah, well, and that's huge. You know, Paul said to Timothy, 1 Timothy 1, 5, but the goal of our instruction is love from a pure heart, a good conscience, and a sincere faith. Mm-hmm. Think about that. What does is, what is a, a struggle with porn do to a pure heart, a good conscience, and a sincere yeah, faith? Wrecks it. Oh, wrecks it all. Yeah, that's the, that's the foundation. Paul says, hey, this is the, the goal of our discipleship. Your love for God, your love for others, it's built on this foundation. And so on the positive side, it's like, 
man, that's that's what we're seeing is, man, people's heart for God hmm. and for the kingdom of God goes to a whole new level. Because, you know, think about it. If a person is not experiencing the freedom that the gospel promises, their excitement for the king and his kingdom is going to diminish. Yeah. Hmm. But when a person is truly experiencing the freedom that the gospel promises, yeah. man, their excitement for the king and his kingdom just goes to a whole new level. And, it. you know, I was just, you know, reading a, a testimony of a guy who, um, you know, sent it into us just recently last week. And he was just talking about, man, my, my wife has seen just what a, a huge difference in our relationship mm. is better than ever. Mm. Man, my walk with God, my prayer life. And man, now my confidence to step out and I'm taking leadership at my church. Yeah. And so all of those areas are impacted. And again, it's this deception of the enemy when a, most men tell themselves, well, dude, my wife and kids, they don't know that I'm, I've got this little habit on the side. Mm. And they think, well, man, you know, you know, one of the lies is, well, hey, at least it's not with another person. And man, no one knows. Mm. And but, dude, I'm telling you, it's impacting you way more than you think yeah. in mm. your pursuit of God, your pursuit of your wife, your pursuit of your kids. It absolutely you know, is, is wreaking havoc. Yeah, and that's what I love about your ministry, Ted, is, is that it's getting to the root, right? There you go. We're, not just, we're not just trying to fix symptoms, but we're trying to, we're trying to get to the disease. Mm. Uh, and I love that. I love that it, it also comes from a position of hope. Right, so there's so much stigma around pornography. There's so much um, guilt and shame that comes with mm-hmm. that, and and you you constantly come at it from a position of hope, from a mm-hmm. position of hey, um, there's a lie the enemy's telling you that this is who you are, this is how you'll always be, but that's not true. And and man, one of my favorite things that was said today, and a lot of good stuff was said today. I love this concept, and I'm going to paraphrase you. Um, you can't outrun porn. Hmm. You have to outgrow it. That's a good word. You have to outgrow it, man. And and growth comes from sanctification. Growth comes from discipleship. So, if you're a pastor listening, if you're uh, if you're a man that's listening or a woman that's listening, and you've been struggling with this, and maybe maybe you've been running as fast and as hard as you can for the last few years, right? You're not enjoying this. The guilt, the shame, the hurt is there. Listen to, to, to my brother today. We can't outrun this. We certainly can't outrun it alone. What we can do is outgrow it mm. by the power of the Spirit there you go. through community, through exposing it, through confessing it, through encouraging one another. Um, uh, and the, the, the result is a greater prayer life, a greater Christ-likeness, a greater, a greater intimacy, not just with each other but with God. Man, that's so good. Thank you so much for being with us today, bro. This yeah. is awesome, man. Hey, it's been great. I've enjoyed it. Yeah, tell us tell us again where, where, where they can find your resources and check you out. Thefreedomfight.org. Yeah, thefreedomfight.org. Love it. Ted, Jonathan, we'll see you all next time. All right. Bye.